All right, well, welcome. My name is Dr. Tiffany O'Meara, and I'm a counseling psychologist at Counseling and Psychological Services on campus. And I've been working there since 2002. And before that, I did my training at UCLA in their pre-doc internship program, and I worked under doc Dr. Nagamoto in the stress clinic there, and that's how I first got interested in working with building social confidence. He led a workshop there. And one of the reasons why I was interested in this topic is that this is me back in high school. I was about a sophomore in high school, and I went through a very awkward stage, and I had definite periods in my life where I felt really nervous and anxious in uh, social situations. And when I was at that time, I had one friend, and we sat in the math hall for lunch. Everyone else was outside, but we were inside. And then if that one friend didn't show up, then I was by myself. So I definitely know what it feels like to feel socially isolated, to not be able to reach social goals. Um, in college, when I was an undergrad, I felt very anxious about talking to professors. And so that was one reason that I took an interest in this. Um, when I, after I worked at UCLA, I then worked at USC, and now I'm at UC San Diego. And over the time, I've built up an eight-week workshop that I run every quarter called Building Social Confidence. So if you can think back to where you were in 1999, I've been running a Building Social Confidence group every quarter since 1999. So the group that I run is based on cognitive behavioral group therapy treatment for social anxiety. But you don't have to have social anxiety to benefit from the things that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, today, I'm going to be talking about some of the highlights from my group. Uh, and I want you to just keep some realistic expectations. So at the end of the workshop today, you might not all be dancing on top of the tables. Uh, but if you do apply some of the things that I talk about today and you really make an effort to apply it in your life, you will be able to make some changes and improve your social confidence. Uh, I've seen some really great um, success. I've had students that were really shy to going to karaoke in front of hundreds of people. I've had students that didn't have any friends to then joining clubs and by the end of the year getting um, elected president of that club. I've had students that uh, have never been in a romantic relationship and I've worked with and by the end of the year they were in their first romantic relationship. So this stuff does work if you really apply it. So today, as you're listening today, you have a question on your worksheet, on your green worksheet there. Uh, when you decided to attend this presentation, what were some of the ways that you were hoping to build your social confidence? And so at the end of the workshop, I want you to be thinking of that question as you're listening, because at the end, I'm going to be asking you what's one behavior that you might be able to change to reach that goal. All right, so let's go over an overview here. We're going to be first talking about how to understand different problems in life. So this is not just in social situations, but you can use this really in any situation in life. And then we're going to be talking about what are some barriers to building social confidence. So we often have certain thought and behavior patterns that keep us anxious in social situations. So we're going to identify what those are. And then, of course, we're going to be teaching you how then, what do you do about that? How can you reduce those barriers, those behavior and thought barriers to build your social confidence? And finally, I'm going to give you five hot tips. So you don't want to leave till you get those five hot tips. Truly, I'm hoping you're going to get many tips besides just those five, but I do have a little section there, five hot tips. So first, we're going to start with understanding problems in life. And so this is a model that's taken from Greenberger and Podesky. It's a cognitive behavioral model, because I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. And so it looks at five different aspects and how they're related to each other. So one of those things, and again, you can look at this with any problem in life, and we're going to apply it today to look at social situations. So the first part of the model is environment. So this is your physical environment. Am I inside? Am I outside? Is it sunny? Is it rainy? Um, am I in front of someone uh, that I've never met before? Or am I with a trusted friend? Am I around family that I feel really comfortable with? Or am I presenting to a big group of people that I don't know? So that's your environment. So it's your physical environment, your social environment. And then you have your thoughts. So thoughts are 
words or images that go through your head. So words like, I'm not going to know what to say, no one's going to like me, um, I'm going to make a fool out of myself, or images. So imagining yourself talking to a professor and going blank, or imagining yourself getting up to give a presentation and, and getting really flustered and nervous. So it's words or images. And then we have moods. So your moods are one word, they're your feelings, such as anger, happiness, sadness, anxious, love, um, irritated, fearful, that sort of thing. And then we have biological factors. So these are your physiological reactions. So are, am I trembling, shaking? Do I have butterflies in my stomach? Is my face blushing? Am I sweating? Uh, so those are your physiological reactions. And then you have your behaviors. So be, it, behaviors are either things that you do or things that you don't do, such as procrastination or avoidance. So when you look at this model, I'm wondering, can anyone point out how maybe two of these things are related? So how one thing will impact the other. And my um, assistant, Natalie, is going to be passing out some stress balls from CAT. So um, as a little reward for those who participate. So can anyone give an example of two and how they might be related and maybe think about social situations? Yes. Um, well, your thoughts can directly affect your moods because um, I guess, like when you're thinking negatively, you'll have a negative mood, um, and then when you're thinking po positively or optimistically, um, you tend to just be happier about things. Great. So your thoughts and your moods are directly related. So if you're thinking really negative, then you're going to feel bad. If you're thinking really positive, then you're going to feel good. All right. So a dir direct relation between thoughts and moods. So one impacts the other. Yes. Such as sadness. Okay. Um, your biological factor would be to cry or like have like a sad expression. So like depression. Absolutely. And so um, you're feeling sad, and then that's going to impact you physiologically. So you're going to cry. You're going to feel depressed. You're going to have maybe no energy. So your moods can be related to your biological factors. And now they're not just these things are not just related one way. They're interrelated. So one will impact the other one, and then in turn, it impacts it back. So can anyone pick out two of these and maybe give an example of how they're interrelated? Yes. Okay, great. So if you've got negative thoughts, that might impact your behaviors. And so you're interacting with people, and then you've got really negative thoughts, and that's impacting how you're interacting and how you're behaving. And then um, the way that those people, so you're actually pulling an environment as well, the way that those people then react back to you is going to impact your thoughts. All right, so she actually pulled in three of those. So um, great. So, and it's not just two or three of these that are interrelated. All five of these parts are interrelated. All right. All right. So, what might be the bad news about the fact that all five of these areas are interrelated? What might be the bad news? Let's see. Someone new. Uh, that one of your, those five things, like you would think about it, or something like a Friday June in the atmosphere or whatever, mm -hmm. um, then all of them are like pounding on you at the same time. Yes. And then it, you like get even more. Absolutely. And I, and I think that um, one thing that you said is really important. If one of these things is chronically going bad, right? So if you're chronically having negative thoughts, for example, then all of the other areas can start to be impacted in a negative way. And it can be like a downward spiral. So it can all start to be negative. All right. So I want to give a typical negative environment. So this is traffic. So let's say that you've got to get to school, you've got to take a test, or you've got to get to work or lab, and you're running late, and you're stuck in traffic. So a typical negative environment. Think about the five-part model. What are some typical ways that people might respond given this negative situation? Yes? Thoughts would be 
Great, so you're having really negative thoughts. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna be late. What if I get fired? What if I fail my exam? So you start thinking really negatively. I can't stand this, this is horrible. So what else happens? Yes? Actions or like behaviors can include road rage, um, birds. <laughs> so, so yes, so, so yes, you're feeling really tense. Okay, so, so we didn't mention that yet, but you can feel anxious or angry. Your body might feel really tense. Um, and then you're thinking bad. Oh my gosh, I can't stand this. And then that's going to impact your behaviors. You mentioned road rage. There you go. <laughs> you mentioned road rage. Now you're impacting other people's five-part model. And so all of these things start to downward spiral. All right. So this can also happen in social situations. So let's say that you've got to go to a party and you start thinking, oh, no one's going to like me. I'm not going to know what to say. And then that's going to start to impact your mood. Maybe you're going to feel sad or maybe you're going to feel anxious or hopeless. And then that can impact how you behave. So maybe you're not making eye contact. Maybe you're staying in a corner and not talking to anybody. And then maybe people are going to respond to that. So your environment might respond to that. So if you're not looking approachable, then maybe no one's going to approach you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're thinking anything bad about you, but maybe it just looks like you don't want to be approached. When I work with students that are shy or anxious, sometimes they'll tell me that once they get to know people, that they'll say to them, you know, when I first met you, I thought you were kind of stuck up, or I thought you were a jerk. Have any of you ever had that experience where people misread you? Um, because when you're anxious and when you're shy, that can be misinterpreted at times. And so um, maybe they're not thinking anything about you, though. Maybe it just looks like you don't want to be approached. But you can create what's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you act in a way that makes your greatest fear come true. So maybe you're not making eye contact, you're isolating, you're not initiating conversation, and then people aren't responding to you. And then you're thinking, see, nobody likes me. I'm not any good at this. People think I'm boring or not interesting. And then you feel hopeless, sad. And then you're not likely to get out there and go to the next party. So see, this is an example of how this can downward spiral. All right. So, but what's interesting is that just because you have a negative environment doesn't mean that everybody responds the same way. I, interested, I, I was listening to Anthony Robbins who, had a, who was talking about interviews that he did with Cher and Bruce Springsteen. And so Cher and Bruce Springsteen are both performers, singers who have to perform in front of very large audiences. And they both talk about uh, similar biological factors that they experience. So their heart races, they get butterflies in their stomach, they're trembling, they're shaking. Um, and what's interesting is that Cher thinks, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out, I'm getting a panic attack, I'm going to get stage fright, I'm not going to be able to get out there and do what I need to do. Um, and then she ends up feeling very anxious and she ends up avoiding. So she's talked about how she's pulled into a venue and gotten herself so psyched up that she had to pull right back out again. Whereas Bruce Springsteen, in his interview, he said, you know what, I feel that. I feel the butterflies in my stomach and my heart is, is racing and I'm trembling, shaking. But what he says to himself is, this is it. I'm ready to get out there. I'm ready to put on a great show. And so he turns that anxiety into more excitement. And then he goes out there and you know, performs in front of large audiences. And the truth is that they both perform in front of large audiences and do a great job, but it's just that Cher goes through a lot more uh, anxiety. I've heard lots of other performers that have experienced the same type of thing. All right, so, and it's the same thing with taking an exam. You've got one exam and 10 people going in to take that exam. All 10 people are going to have a slightly different experience. Or walking into a party, same party, 10 different people, 10 different experiences. So what, you know, when thinking about these examples and you think about the five-part model, what might be one thing that's making a difference here? Yes, like there's thoughts about it. So maybe with someone would feel really prepared for the set, so they're like, oh, I'm completely done with this, I'm mm -hmm. done with it's like that. And for the party, people might think that because they have people they know from the party, so they have someone to talk to. So great. So. You said a couple of important things. One is, um, I think the most important is your thoughts, how you're thinking about it. But you also mentioned something, preparation. Preparation for both um, 
an exam and even going to a party can be important. Um, but I, what I really want to focus on at this moment is uh, your thoughts, your perception. So there's a great quote by Lena Horn: it's not the load that breaks you down, it's the way you carry it. So if you've heard that about you got to carry a heavy package, it's not so much that it's heavy, but what's important is how you pick it up. And it's the same thing with life and challenges and social situations. It's not necessarily the social situation itself that's the problem, but how are you approaching it? What's your perception? How are you thinking about it? So what then might be the good news about the fact that all five of these parts are interrelated? Yes. As much as anyone part can negatively affect the other four, one part can also positively affect the other. Exactly. So just as how one might negatively impact the others, one can also positively impact the others. So if something starts going in a more positive direction, then all the other areas are going to respond differently. And there can also be a positive spiral upwards. So what I like is that you can start in just one area. Because these are all interrelated, you can start in one area because all five parts are interrelated. Um, and, and the model is like circular. Um, for physiological, I've had students that start medication. So there's some great medication that can help to reduce anxiety in social situations. I've had students that are very self-conscious and always judging themselves, and they can't turn their brain off. And they start taking medication, and about a month later, all of a sudden, they're saying, oh, I just don't feel as inhibited anymore, and I'm able to talk, or I might have a worry, but I don't have that worry again and again and again. So medication can be really helpful for social situations. But in here, for, so sorry, for anxiety, for reducing anxiety in social situations. Um, in here, though, I want to really focus on thoughts and behaviors, and that's because I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. And so we're going to be really looking at what thought and behavior patterns can improve this, um, this spiral upwards. All right, so let's go back to the example of traffic. So um, what might be some thoughts, behaviors, or things that you could do physiologically that might help improve the situation. Yes. Turn up the radio, listen to good music. Great. So she said turn up the radio, listen to some good music. So either something relaxing or something that makes you feel energized. Um, so you're changing the environment as much as you can. What another example? So deep breathing. So changing your physiological response by doing deep breathing. Very important. Any other ideas? What about what I was talking about with perception? Yes? When you start telling yourself that it's going to be OK, that it's kind of Great. So change some of that self-talk. It's going to be OK. Other people have been late to work, and they haven't been fired. This is not the end of the world. I can get notes from somebody else. You know, start using some of that positive thinking. You know, at least I'm not the one that's stuck in the accident. You know, this get some greater perspective about this, right? So, and it's the same thing with a party. So if you think instead of, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to talk to anybody, I'm not going to know what to say, if instead you can say something like, I'm going to set a goal tonight to talk to one new person, or I can do this, I've made friends before and I can do it again, um, then you might feel encouraged, you might feel hopeful. If you change your behavior, if you make eye contact, if you smile, if you say, I'm going to initiate a conversation, and then people might respond differently to you. So it's more of a positive spiral upwards. All right, let's see. So the best news of all, um, you don't need to change your life completely. You just need to make some small changes. And it's not like one small change will change your life, but it's small changes over time. So quickly, I just want to mention the difference between shyness and shame. Um, David Burns talks about this. It's important to consider um, the difference between, for example, anxiety and shame. So there's nothing wrong with shyness. That's why my group is not called the shyness group. So it's normal to have anxiety in social situations. And in fact, sometimes anxiety can actually help us perform better in social situations. Um, but it's really the shame that's more of a problem. And that's thoughts like, um, normal people don't have this problem. I shouldn't be shy. What's wrong with me? It's that sort of problem. So shyness without the shame is not a problem. And anxiety is a problem only if there's too much anxiety. So we're never going to be able to get rid of anxiety. So the goal is how do you reduce anxiety? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. All right. So. Um, 
here are some er typical errors in anxious thinking. So for barriers to social confidence, these are some of the, the thought barriers. So when we're anxious, we tend to make some mistakes in our thinking and we tend to overestimate things. So one thing that we overestimate is the probability that something's gonna happen, the likelihood that something's gonna happen. We also overestimate the danger level. We call that catastrophizing. So not only will it happen, but it will be awful. It will be dangerous. It will be horrible. We overestimate the consequence. So we get stuck on all these what ifs. What if I talk to my professor and I completely blank out? What if I ask someone on a date and they reject me? We get into all of these what ifs, but then we never ask ourselves, well, then what? So we overestimate that the consequence, that we can't stand it, that we can't handle it. But then what? You know, often we can handle it. Um, and then also we overestimate that others are thinking something negative about us. So that's called mind reading. Um, when actually most people are thinking about, anyone know what most people are thinking about? Themselves. So most people are thinking about themselves. So what we tend to underestimate when we're anxious, we underestimate our capabilities. So people have much more ability than they give themselves credit for. So I see this all the time when I send students out to start facing their social fears and start building their social confidence. They get out there and they come back and they say, wow, I actually did really, really well. Um, and then two, they underestimate their ability to cope. So even if it doesn't go well, if you do get rejected, if something doesn't go well, you can get through that. And we can help you with that. We can teach you ways to get through difficult situations. And then underestimate that others will help us. So people are often afraid of, well, what if there's silence? I'm not gonna know what to say. Well, others are in that conversation too, so it's not just all up to you. Others will help. So um, there are other errors in thinking that we make and they're called cognitive distortions. So cognitive or thought and distortion. So errors in distorted thinking. So the first one here is this Gary Larson cartoon where the pilots are talking and the one pilot says, the fuel lights on Frank, we're all gonna die, we're all gonna die. Oh, wait, wait, uh, oh, that's my mistake. That's the intercom light. And then you've got all the people <gasps> freaking out. <laughs> so that's catastrophizing. That's when you look at something and uh, you blow it up to be the biggest problem in the world. Oh, when really maybe it's not that bad. Overgeneralization. So overgeneralization is that when you make a general conclusion based on one incident or a single piece of evidence. So, um, so you ask someone out on a date and uh, they say no and then you think that no one's ever going to like you or no one's ever going to want to go out with you. Um, and often overgeneralizations sound like, I never do this, they never like me, or everyone hates me, or I'm never good at these kinds of situations. It's that kind of extreme talking. All or nothing is thinking in black and white terms with no gray areas, which isn't really reality. So for example, you get back an exam and you got two wrong and you focus on those two that you got wrong um, instead of looking at the bigger picture. So it's all or nothing thinking. Um, if, it's I, if that person doesn't like me, then I'm a loser. Um, if I don't get an A, then I'm a failure. When in reality, um, well, maybe that person doesn't like you, but maybe there'll be other people that will be better matches for you. Um, I got an intro, I got, a, um, I got two C's in my undergrad, and one of them was an intro to psych. But I still was able to follow my dream and be a psychologist. An intro to psych is really hard. <laughs> so um, that's the all or nothing. Then mind reading. Mind reading is automatically assuming that you know someone's thinking something about you and often based on a facial expression. So you walk into a room and you see people laughing and you personalize that and think that's about you. Or someone gives you a dirty look and you think that it's about you and maybe they're really just having a bad day. And selective abstraction is when you, you magnify the negative and you filter out the positive. So you go on a, on a date and um, you, you focus on the two things that you think that you really sounded stupid um, instead of maybe looking at the bigger picture. So that's selective abstraction. So with these errors in thinking, you believe these things to be true when really there might not be any ground to support that. And so these are ungrounded assumptions that are based on fears and they're not based on reality all of the time. But you, if you make these assumptions you, your reality, then you can be in for a lot of pain. So um, 
those are some barriers to thinking. Now we're gonna be looking at barriers, your uh, behavioral barriers to building social confidence. All right. So one of those behaviors is avoidance. So when we're anxious in social situations, we'll tend to avoid. So let's say there's a grad student social, uh, but I'm feeling anxious and nervous, so I'm not gonna go. Um, and then there's escape. So escape is another behavior that we do when we're feeling anxious. So maybe you'll go to the party, but if it gets too uncomfortable, you'll, you'll escape, you'll leave. And then we also have safety behaviors. So maybe I'll go to the party, but I'll smoke ahead of time or I'll drink a lot while I'm there. We call that liquid courage. So that's a safety behavior. You make yourself feel a little bit more comfortable. We can also have more subtle safety behaviors like let's say you're sitting in class and you're on your phone and you're texting or you're looking at the internet or you've got your earbuds in listening to your, your, your music and you're not having your head up, you're not engaging with people around you. So those can be safety behaviors when you're feeling anxious in social situations. Um, I have this picture of this bloody eyeball up here because I'm going to give an example. Let's say that um, you have a fear of blood and you're flipping around the TV and you get stuck on a, a channel where they're showing an operation and it's a bloody eyeball operation. And so you freak out and I see some of you go, oh, uh, you're freaking out because you're fearful of blood. So what are you likely to do? you change the channel, right? I'm not gonna watch this. And so what you've just done if you, is you successfully reduced your fear. But what you've also just done is you successfully reinforced your fear because you're not staying on the channel. Um, so you're never learning if it's as bad as you think it is. So the next time you go to see an operation channel and they're doing a bloody eyeball operation, you're gonna be just as likely to avoid it. All right. So one thing I want you to do right now is I want you to look at the second question there on your green worksheet and it asks you what is one thought or behavior that's getting in your way of reaching your social goals. So I want you to think about those errors in thinking and I want you to think about some of those typical um, behaviors and identify what might be one of those things that's getting in your way and go ahead and just reflect on that for a moment. And then what I want you to do is take a social risk in here, and I want you to turn to a neighbor, and since you're already at tables, and it's okay if there's three of you at one, or if one wants to join behind you, um, and just share what one of those thoughts or behaviors are that you have. All right, so why don't you take just a couple of moments and do that. All right, so would anyone, would maybe a couple people, and we still have those stress balls we're handing out, would a couple people mind sharing uh, what might be one of their thoughts or behaviors that they feel is a barrier for them? Yes. I'm extremely insecure of myself. Okay, okay. So have, did you notice some of those negative thought patterns then? Yeah. Okay, great. So when you're feeling insecure and you don't have the belief that you can do things, then that's gonna be self-defeating before you're even getting out there. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else notice? So for him, it was thoughts, thoughts that came up. Anyone else that noticed? What might be one of your barriers? Yes. The fear of failing in my athletics. Oh, okay. And so again, for you, a thought, a fear of, of failing. All right. So sometimes people have fear of failing. Sometimes people have fear of success, too. As, as funny as that might sound, that sometimes it can be comfortable to be where you're at, and it might actually be scary to think about succeeding. So these are really common thoughts that I hear that students have. And so um, let's talk about then, well, what do you do then about these thoughts? So why change thoughts? OK, so as I mentioned before, um, if you're having chronic negative or if you're making some of these errors in your thinking and it's part of that five part model, then it can be maintaining a downward spiral. So that's why it's really important to look at your thoughts because if your thoughts are negative chronically, then how is everything else gonna be impacted, right? I wanna give you an example and I'm, when I give examples of my past clients, I'm not using their real names, so I wanna point that out from the beginning. So when I was at UCLA, one of my first students that I ever worked with, with social, building his social confidence, his name was Jacob. And he really wanted 
a romantic relationship. He had never been in a romantic relationship. And so he started setting behavioral goals to go out and start conversations with women that he found attractive. And so uh, his goal every week was to go out and start these conversations. But when he was going out, he kept having these thoughts like, I'm not good enough, no one's gonna like me, I'm not attractive, they're gonna think I'm a loser. And so all of these thoughts were just setting him up for failure before he was even getting started and it was impacting how he was approaching people. And what was, a, and this is a true story, I'm not lying. Um, when I was at UCLA and I was a trainee, I saw 15 students. So if you think about you know, how big UCLA is, maybe at the time there were 30,000 students or more. And out of all those students, I had 15 students that I met with. And one of them was a female student who had lower self-esteem. And she came in to see me one day and said, you're not gonna believe this, Tiffany. I was working at the bookstore and this guy approached me and he started talking to me and we started having a conversation and she's telling me the story and I'm thinking, this sounds like Jacob. And could this be Jacob? And she starts telling me the story. She says, oh yeah, and the conversation was great. And at the end he asked me for my phone number. And I'm just thinking, how could this be? Could this be real? And I, but I'm excited for her and I say, oh, that's great. Well, what did you say? And she says, oh, well, I didn't give him my phone number. I told him that I had a boyfriend. And I said, but you don't have a boyfriend. I said, why did you tell him this? Why didn't you give me your number? And she says, oh, well, I was really flattered. I just was really flustered and I didn't know what to say and I was anxious and, and so I just told him that I had a boyfriend, but this was great, you know, this was so great for her and she felt great and she left that day feeling just great. But I knew, I just knew it was Jacob and lo and behold, a couple days later, Jacob comes into my office, you know, looking down. And I said, okay, Jacob, how did your homework go? And so he starts telling me the same exact story, but from his point of view. And he says, oh, I went to the bookstore, and there was this really cute girl, and I go up, and, and I start talking with her. And you know, I felt like the conversation was going really well. Uh, but then at the end, I asked her for her number, but she said she had a boyfriend. But I know she didn't have a boyfriend. I know it's just because she thought that I was a loser and ugly and not interesting. And you know, so he was really saying that it was his fault. And I said to him, well, Jacob, can you think of any other reason? Can you think of any other reason why she, you know, maybe she did have a boyfriend. No, no, she didn't. I know she was lying. She just wasn't inter just interested. She thought that I was a loser. And I said, well, can you think of any other explanation? And he says, no, no, I can't think of anything else. And I said, well, what if she was really nervous herself and she was, she was really flattered, but she was flustered and she didn't know what to say, so she just told you that she had a boyfriend, but that maybe she was really excited about you and really thought you were great. And he looked at me and he said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that is ridiculous. And the thing is, is that I couldn't do anything about it because that was my client. I have client uh, confidentiality. I can't tell him that she was my client and that I actually knew the truth. But this was so, so, such a great experience, not for Jacob, but for me, because I realized, I realized how powerful these thoughts are and how that was not reality, but that was how he perceived things. That's what he, how his reality was perceived, and he believed it, even though it really, you know, I knew the reality, but he interpreted it from his lens. And so this negative thinking, um, it can be a barrier and that can keep us from building our, our social confidence. And what's really difficult to work with is that the nature of these thoughts is that these thoughts can be automatic. They happen in a split second. And you might not even be aware that you're carrying on a negative pattern of thinking. And so you could be maintaining a downward spiral and not even realize it. All right, so. Um, I want to give you some examples of negative thoughts that students in the group, so students in the group talk about their experiences and they don't know it, but I'm taking notes on what they're saying. And these are some of the things that they say. What if I say something stupid? I don't know what to say. What are they going to think of me? They'll think I'm boring, I'm awkward, I'm not interesting, I'm not intelligent. Nobody cares what I have to say. I'm not competent, I'm going to fail. I'm always gonna be alone, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm too nervous, I'm too shy, I'll never have a girlfriend or boyfriend, I'm not likable, I'll be rejected, there's something wrong with me. So often these thoughts underneath them is either 
fears of being inadequate, not good enough, or fears of being unlovable, not liked. All right, so these patterns, they develop through time. So it's not like one day you just woke up and started thinking you know, negative thoughts. These things develop through time. And sometimes they can start as young as childhood. Um, for example, maybe you have parents that you had some negative messages from parents. But not always, maybe you had really supportive parents, but maybe you were teased by peers or had some difficult uh, peer experiences. I know for me, <laughs> junior high in particular was very difficult. Can anyone else relate to, to that? Yes, I see hands going up, junior high. You know, junior high was one of those things that you think you're okay and then you look back and you're like, wow, that really sucked. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, or maybe you're just shy and so you haven't got taken any social risk, so you don't believe that you can do that. So the thing is that, that these thought patterns, you know, they make sense back in childhood. And when you're a child, you're not going to say there's something wrong with you. Um, so you think there's something wrong with me. And you have, children have these catastrophic thoughts. They have this black and white, all or nothing thinking. And so uh, there are reasons for these thoughts. They start somewhere. It's no coincidence. Uh, but they might not be working for us anywhere uh, anymore. So in the past, you know, as a child, they made sense, but now it's maybe not reality, and these same thoughts and fears aren't working for us anymore. So the bad news is that we can get stuck in these patterns, and like I mentioned, we get stuck without even realizing it. And then that can impact your mood. You can become depressed or anxious. It can impact your behavior. You're avoiding things. Um, but the good news is that you can change these patterns. You can learn to change these patterns. You're an adult, and you can work on changing these automatic patterns. Uh, but the first step is to have some compassion, that there's maybe reasons why you're feeling this way. Maybe there's reasons why you avoid. And so to, to just understand that, remember, we want to reduce the shame. So OK, I, there's reasons why I'm feeling anxious in this situation. And the sooner that you can accept that and not beat yourself up, so you might feel anxious, but you don't want to feel anxious about being anxious, or you don't want to feel angry about being anxious, all right? And the sooner you can accept that, that that's OK, uh, the sooner that you can be on your way to making improvements. So you can change old habits by changing the way you think. And remember, you're the only one that's carrying your past around. So when people meet you, uh, no one knows that you were that little boy or that little girl that was shy or that got teased, and that uh, when people meet you, you have an opportunity now to do different thought, um, have different thoughts and engage in different behaviors. All right, here's a great quote. What great achievement by a pessimist do we remember? I can't think of one. We can only achieve great things if we believe it's possible, and if we can silence, at least for a little while, that whiny little no nobody who'd like us to stay put and not accomplish our dreams. All right, so one way that you can work to change your thoughts is through cognitive restructuring. So cognitive, your thoughts, restructuring, changing them. So the goal is to create more realistic thinking. So this is not just positive thinking, because positive thinking isn't going to be realistic either. So thinking that you're the greatest thing in the world is no better than thinking you're the worst thing in the world, because neither one of these are really realistic. So you want to look at things more realistic. So not everybody's going to like us. Not every social interaction is going to go well. But that's OK. So we just want to think more realistically. Um, and cognitive restructuring works. There's been a lot of research on it, and they found that cognitive restructuring works as well as antidepressant medication does in helping to reduce anxiety, reduce depression. So um, the way that you can do this is by using something called a thought record. In your um, group of handouts, I gave you a pink handout that explains the steps of a thought record and a yellow handout that is an example of a thought record. And um, on one side, the thought record's blank. And on the other side, the thought record has an example on it. And so I'm not going to take you through an entire um, thought record right now, but I want to say that um, when you challenge your thoughts and you find that they're not 100% accurate, you're able to come up with more realistic thinking, and new realistic thinking is going to lead to new feelings and new behaviors. So let me show you. Um, this is, um, these are the steps of a thought record, 
And so basically what you want to do just very quickly is identify when you are feeling upset because a hot feeling like anxiety before a social situation is a sign that you've got a hot feeling. And if you can start to identify what your thoughts are, and remember how we talked about cognitive distortions? If you can start to realize what part of your thinking is maybe distorted or not quite accurate, and then you're gonna be like a scientist. Here we are at UC San Diego. So we're gonna be good scientists. We're gonna look at what's the evidence for our beliefs, what's the evidence against our beliefs, and then we're gonna be coming up with more realistic thinking. Um, and this takes practice because we have a negative automatic pattern of thinking that's going very quickly. And so it's like being at the teacups. So that's a picture of me on the teacups at Disneyland. That's my grad school. So I went to UC Irvine for undergrad, but I went to USC for grad school. So there I am on the teacups. You're spinning one way. That's your negative thinking, all right? Using a thought record and starting to be aware of what your thoughts are and starting to challenge those thoughts that's like you being on the teacups and trying to get it to go the other direction. And at first when you try to do that, it's really slow and it's very difficult, but if you keep it up, it can start going just as fast in the other direction. So that's what it's like to change your thought patterns. If they're really chronically negative and you write it down, um, if you want some more self-help with thought records, David Burns, The Feeling Good Handbook, and Greenberger and Podesky have the Mind Over Mood thought records and they can help you with these. And if you have trouble on your own, then you can seek out counseling to get some help identifying some of your negative patterns and changing some of those negative patterns. But it really works. David Burns will tell you, take your pencil and put it on your paper. It doesn't work to do it in your head. You have to be writing it down. And it takes some time because if you're gonna practice anything and change those patterns, you need to do it regularly. So the suggestion is 10 weeks. So the great thing is that a quarter is 10 weeks. So if you took a quarter and you said, okay, for a quarter, whenever I'm feeling down, whenever I'm feeling anxious, I'm gonna fill out one of these thought records, you would, by the end of that quarter, would start to be thinking different, all right? You'd start to th see things in a more realistic versus an anxious light. And really, this is the heart of building social confidence, if you can be aware of those thought patterns and start to change that. So now we're gonna talk about behaviors and things you can do. So regret for things we did can be tempered in by time. It is regret for things that we did not do that is inconsolable. So why is it necessary to change behaviors? So any guesses about why we need to change our behavior when you think about the five-part model? Why would you need to change your behavior? So you're working on your thoughts, you're feeling better, but why do you need to change your behavior? Yes. Because that can put, that can go back onto all the other parts and you get a negative reaction again. Yes. So like the five part model, they're all interrelated. So if you start changing your behaviors, that can bring better um, responses in those other areas. So we change our behavior because if you keep doing the same thing all of the time, you're not gonna get any different results, all right? So there's something called behavioral exposure. So whenever you're afraid of something, and this could be any kind of phobia, but like let's say with social situations, talking to a professor, for example, you need to face that fear. And you can do that a couple different ways. One is through, so behavioral exposure means exposing you to the thing that you fear. All right, so you can do that a couple ways. One is through flooding. So if, do any of you remember the show Fear Factor on TV? Yes. So this is a picture from Fear Factor. Um, so this is where they took people's greatest fears and they just exposed them to their greatest fears. So let's say this guy had a fear of snakes. Well, we're going to put your head in a box and we're going to cover your head with snakes. So that's flooding. You just face your greatest fear head on. And then there's systematic desensitization. So systematic desensitization is taking things gradually a step at a time. So you start where your anxiety barriers are lowest and then work your way up, all right? And the reason why exposure works is that the fight or flight response can't go on forever. So when you get anxious, your fight or flight gets activated and you get all of these physiological reactions, your heart's racing and you're, um, you're trembling and shaking and sweating, but that's not gonna go on forever. And at some point you have to be able to calm down, all right? 
So remember the eyeball example, the bloody eyeball operation. So uh, we tend to avoid or want to escape our fears. But like I said, if you keep avoiding that bloody eyeball channel, then you're gonna be just as scared the next time you turn to that channel. So as I mentioned, we do not overcome anxiety until we make changes in those avoidance behaviors. And so, and that's because if you never change your behavior, you're never giving yourself the chance to test out those negative predictions. So gathering, testing out your fears lets you gather accurate information. So it's either going to be not as bad as you think, or maybe it is going to be as bad as you think, but you can learn some tools and skills to get through it. All right, and, or you can cope with it if it doesn't go well. And so this happens all the time with students. So when they go out to face their social fears, they come back and they say to me, oh, you know what, it wasn't as bad as I thought. Or they say, oh, well, you know, it was hard, but I did it, I got through it. And so when we change, when we face our fears, that's when we overcome our fears. So Lucille Ball, who's one of the greatest comedians of all time, says, I'm not funny, I'm brave. So here's a couple of examples, real life examples of how this works. So um, I'm going to give you again two examples of two people. These are not their real names, but they are real people. So one is systematic desensitization. And so this is where I mentioned where you start with your, um, your smallest fears and work your way up to your largest fears. So I saw a graduate student named Robbie. And Robbie came into my office and he said, in one year from now, I have to defend my dissertation in front of a large group of people. And he said, I'm terrified of this. I, I hate public speaking and I hate doing these kinds of things. And Robbie, when I would look at him, was one of the most anxious looking people that I had ever seen. He sat in my chair and he was, his leg was constantly shaking and he just looked fearful and anxious and he was talking really rapidly and he, and he was one of the most anxious looking people I ever saw and I said to him, Robbie, we're gonna do this. We're gonna start small and we're gonna work our way up and I explained to him the same thing that I was talking to all of you about and when he left my office, I said, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna, I don't know if he's gonna be able to do this because he was so anxious. Uh, but we worked for a year and he started very small. So for example, um, him and his girlfriend went to a restaurant. Instead of her doing all of the talking, he ordered from the server. And then the next time he went out, he ordered from the server and he asked the server a personal question like, oh, so how is your day going? And then he said, okay, well, when I'm in my discussion group, I'm gonna make a comment, but I'm gonna make the comment at the end of the class and I'm gonna sit by the door. So if I say something really stupid, I can just leave really fast. And then that went well. So see, each step, once it goes well and you feel less anxious, then you work your way up to the next step. So then his next step was, okay, now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna sit in the back of the class and I'm gonna say something at the beginning of class. And then that way if it's stupid, I gotta sit there the whole time and I gotta learn how to cope with that. And so he kept working his way up. He wanted to apply for a job. So I worked with him and he learned tools. So it's not like he's doing this all on his own. He's learning tools, he's learning how to relax. He's learning some social confidence uh, skills. And he went out on a job interview and he got the job. And then at the job, he had to give tours. So he had to face his fears and start giving tours. And then um, he joined a public speaking class and he started to give speeches in front of that class. And then he started to volunteer first. So he just worked his way up slowly to by the end, he was successfully able to defend his dissertation in front of a group. And he did great. And this is not like this all happened like this, it happened slowly over time, all right? So that's systematic desensitization. And then the other example is flooding. And so this is back to Jacob again, the same UCLA student that I told you about. So Jacob had the opposite. He did not want to start small. He wanted to just get in there right away because he wanted to have a girlfriend really bad and he didn't want to wait. And so he was willing to get out there and he started having conversations with girls he found attractive and he, he had to face rejection. You know, he had to face rejection again and again. And so flooding can be difficult in that way. But if you, if you listen to David Burns talk, who's one of the big cognitive um, psychologists, he says, you know, he's a big fan of flooding. He'll say, 
get out there and just do almost the most ridiculous thing that you can. Make a fool of yourself so you can realize it's not as bad as you think or you can get through it. So it's these shame attacking exercises that he'll have people do where you just have no shame. You just go out there and you just say, I'm sick of this and I'm not going to have any shame about this anymore. So that's <laughs> flooding. Um, I want to give just a quick example of my own experience where I really try to practice what I preach. I try, you know, when I'm on airplanes, I try talking to strangers, um, and I try to face my own fears, because if I'm here talking to students to do this, I have to do it myself. And one of my fears was going to the gym. And um, when I was about 32 years old, I decided um, that I needed to start going to the gym, but I was really nervous about that. Does anybody else relate to my fear? Yes, I see some of you relating. Like, I'm thinking, what am I gonna wear? I see that hand bit went up really high. <laughs> what am I gonna wear? What am I gonna do? Um, are people gonna be staring at me? What if I don't know how these machines work? I'm gonna make a fool out of myself. And so, but I, I knew I needed to do it. And so I went and I signed up for the gym and I had the one guy teach me how to work one machine, the elliptical machine. And I started small, and as I was on the elliptical machine, I kind of looked around, and I realized, okay, what are people wearing? What are people doing? What can I try next? And so then I tried a class, and it was a step class. And step sounds pretty easy, right? Like, step, how hard can a step be? Like, I'm going to go up and down on a step. That's not too hard. Well, the step came in multiple pieces. So it was like six pieces that I had to put the step together. And I put it together in the front of the class because I thought, I want to see what's going on. And I talked to the teacher at the beginning and I said, you know, I've taken some dance before. You think I can do this? And she said, well, yeah, you know, but it's, you know, whoa, it's, uh, it's challenging. And I said, well, you know, I've done dance. If I'm in the front, I'm going to be OK. So they start going, and for the first five minutes in the class, I'm in the front, and I'm going up and down and up and down, and I'm going, all right, this is easy, I got this. And then, all of a sudden, five minutes into it, the song changes, and all these people in this class knew this different routine that they were all seemed to know it together, and they were going like up and down and spin around and going left and going right, and I was completely lost, completely lost, and it was an hour class. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I can either sit here I have a few options. I can either sit here in class and try to move and try to do this in the front of the class and just look like a complete idiot, or I can just keep going up and down while everybody else is dancing, or I can leave. And so I decided to leave. But I couldn't just leave because the step was in like six pieces. So I had to pick up the step and put it back and then go back and pick up more of the step and put it back. And I felt so humiliated and I felt so stupid. And I thought in my head, Everybody's looking at me. Everybody's thinking something bad about me. I can't even show my face, take any classes anymore. So I was mind reading. I was over generalizing. I was ca catastrophizing, but I believed it to be true. And you know what? I didn't face my fear, and I never went back to that class. <laughs> But what I did do was I learned from my experience, and the next class that I took, I sat in the back of the class, and I worked my way up to figure out how that class went. And then I was really intimidated by the weight room, and so I said, well, I'll just walk through the weight room really quick. Okay, I did that. That went okay. Well, now I'm going to sign up for personal training. So I did that, and then I was taught what to do, so then I knew what to do. Uh, by the end, I felt so comfortable that I was so comfortable and I made so many friends at the gym and that's how I met um, my current husband. I met him through the gym and that would have never happened if I wouldn't have faced my fear. So I really try to practice what I preach and I tell you these things do work, I know from personal experience. But what if something goes wrong? So um, one thing that I talk about is using perspective shifting. So let's say that you're in a social situation and you don't know how to approach it. So one thing that you can do is try to shift your perspective and think, what would I tell somebody else to do? What would I tell a close friend? What would I tell a younger sibling? What would I tell them to do? And suddenly you're able to come up with the answer. I used to be really fearful of heights and when I would go out on jetties, I would be the biggest wimp and I'd cry and I'd be with my boyfriend and I'd be whining and crying. And all of a sudden I had to lead a camp of kids seven to 10 years old and we had to go out on the jetties. I couldn't whine and cry in front of those kids, so I had to 
act like I was confident. And I had to go out there and say, okay, this is what you need to do. So I had to shift my perspective from getting out of my own anxiety to think, well, what would I say to them? How would I do it? And so when you think about what would I tell somebody else, suddenly you're able to come up with an answer. Another thing that you can do is think of a role model. So think of somebody in your life, or it can be a celebrity, that you think of as confident socially confident, and you think, well, how would they do it? How would they approach it? And you can use this technique in a split second when you're in a social situation. So if I'm leading a therapy group, so early on in my career when I was leading a therapy group or I would be one-on-one -on -one counseling somebody and they would say something and I would have a moment of, oh, I don't know what to say back to them. I would imagine Dr. Nagamoto, my mentor from UCLA, I kind of imagine him on my shoulder like a little mini me, like a little Dr. Nagamoto. And I would think just for a split second, how would Dr. Nagamoto do it? What would he say? And in that split second, I'm able to come up with the answer. And I've worked with students that, for example, they get an RA position and they're really anxious about being an RA. They have to knock on doors, they have to enforce rules, they have to build relationships, they want to be likable, but they're really socially anxious. And I say, well, how would a confident RA do it? So when you go out, how would a confident RA walk into a room? And so you do something that we call fake it till you make it. So it sounds silly, but it really works. So you fake like you're confident. So you feel anxious on the inside, but you fake like you're confident. All right, on the outside. Um, I have James Bond up there, Sean Connery playing James Bond. And the reason why is that James Bond is thought of as this cool guy, this cool, charismatic guy. But what's really interesting is that, does anybody know how many actors play the role of James Bond? Anyone know? Six. Six different actors have played the role of James Bond. And so they're all different people but they all think in their head, how would James Bond do it? So how would I look? How would I act? How would I talk? And each one is slightly different, but when you watch them on screen, you get a sense like, yeah, that's James Bond. So that's what we can do. Like, how would a confident, how would a confident Tiffany do her presentation? All right? And then you practice. And you want to practice, practice, practice. So if you really want to build your social confidence in dating, in talking to your professor, and speaking in large groups, then you want to talk everywhere. You want to go to the grocery store, and you want to start up a conversation with the clerk. And really, you can practice this anywhere. So you're standing in line for the shuttle, you can start a conversation. You're sitting in class, you can start a conversation. Um, I had a girlfriend that was in a restaurant and she saw someone she thought was attractive and um, they made, you know, they smiled at each other, one of these kind of smiles. And she left, she avoided it, but her friend went back and her friend gave the person her phone number and said, my girlfriend thought that you were really cute, I think you should give her a call. And he did, and you know what? They're married now. And it's one of the best marriages that I know. And neither one of them had ever been in that restaurant before, and neither one of them had ever gone to that restaurant again. They never would have met each other unless the friend would have been confident to say something. So, so now I'll say that with a disclaimer. Please be careful when you're out and just talking to strangers. <laughs> Make sure that you're safe. But really, you can start conversations anywhere. All right. And um, so what to talk about? So common ground. So think about a common experience that you're having in that moment um, or trying to find something that you share in common. Because once you find something in common, then the conversation can go much smoother and much easier. Compliments. So starting with a compliment. So um, Joshua, I love your sweater. You know, <laughs> and then you can say, where did you get that? So you can start a conversation with somebody. And that's, I've met lots of people that way, sitting in class, again, sit, you know, waiting for a gym class to start, giving a compliment, asking a question, and then going from there. Stay current. So what I mean by this is keep up on the news. Keep up on what's going on in the world. If you don't read the news right now, start reading the news, at least getting an idea of you know, the top stories. It won't take too much long each day to do that at breakfast or lunch. And then also stay current with pop culture, things that lots of people know about. So and it could be anything. It could be movies, TV, sports, video games, books, art, 
theater. I mean, it could be anything, whatever interests you, but stay on top of it so that you have something to talk about. And these are the kinds of things that you can just be in a group and say, hey, did anybody see any good movies lately? Or hey, um, did anybody see what's going on the news lately? What did you think about that? And so um, those are some ideas. The other thing is focus on the other person. So what do people like to talk about the most? themselves, yes. So people think about themselves the most and they like to talk about themselves the most. So focus on the other person and ask them about themselves. But it doesn't need to be like an, a job interview or anything. Um, it's a back and forth. So you know, you ask a, a question and, and talk and take an interest in what they're talking about and then they're gonna ask you a question. Um, really try to get outside of your head that's judging yourself and how am I doing and try to instead focus on the person you're talking to and really take an interest in what they're talking about and ask them follow-up questions with that. I was overhearing a conversation in the gym the other day and a guy was talking to this girl and I, it was 45 minutes that he was talking about himself. Yeah, <laughs> I hear groans in the audience, yes. Um, you don't want to do that. Don't worry so much that you're entertaining. What people really want is that back and forth. So you don't need to feel the pressure that you need to entertain. Yes, of course, you can tell stories about your own experiences. That's great. But make sure that you're also asking the other person about themselves. Maintaining conversation, it's like an onion. So when you first meet somebody, think about an onion and the layers are shallow. So when you first meet someone, you're going to be talking about things like, do you know what you're going to write your paper on? And you're peeling off these layers. You know, do you know what you're going to write your paper on? Do you, how did your exam go? What are you going to do this weekend? And then you start to get to know them, and you peel off those layers, and you get deeper. Uh, so what do you like to do for fun? Where did you grow up? Do you have any siblings? What's your relationship like with your parents? And then you get to know them more. So what are your um, dreams? What are your hopes? What do you want to do for a career? What are your thoughts of life after death? You know, you can ask these kinds of questions. But you don't want to start off that way. So you want to start off small and then work your way. And that's how conversations and that's how friendships get built. So in, in social situations, be positive. So um, Nobody wants to hear about how you're irritated with your roommates and how your sink is clogged up and how you don't know what you want to do for your career and you're having trouble with OCHEM. You know, when you're first meeting somebody, nobody wants to hear about all of these down things all of the time. You know, that's kind of like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. You know, you don't want to be a downer all of the time. People want to be with people that, you know, make them feel good. So be positive. Look at the positive things going on and try to talk about those things. That doesn't mean that you can't bring up negative things. When you have a friendship with somebody, of course you want to confide. Of course you want to talk about how tough OCHEM is. You know, you can relate to that. Um, so it's not that you never want to bring up those things, but you just don't want to start there. You don't want to go out on a date and, stop and talk about all the negative things. So try to see the positive thing, positive in things. Second is relax. So when I was an undergrad, I really wanted to get to know this professor, Dr. Roxy at UC Irvine. And I just thought she was so wonderful. She is wonderful. And I would get so nervous when I was around her. And at one point, she just we were walking, and she said to me, Tiffany, relax. <laughs> Relax, you know, and it was okay. Yeah, I can just relax. It's okay. I can just relax around her. Same thing with the um, Robbie, the example earlier. I told him slow down, just slow down. So that's a really great tip to try to just take it easy, take it slow. Um, people often are worried about silence in conversations. That's a natural part. Conversations go like this. So you, you get on a topic, it goes well for a while, and then there's some silence. So just try to relax. And remember, it's a two-way street. They're responsible for carrying on conversations, too. Focus on action versus outcome. What you really want to focus your attention on is what is the behavior that you're doing. So I'm going to go to class today, and I'm going to start a new conversation with somebody versus looking at the outcome. Are they going to like me? Are they going to become a new friend? that's gonna be somewhat out of your control. So what you wanna focus on is are you making those behavior changes that you need to make and focus on the action versus looking at the outcome, okay? Um, then get used to rejection and failure. So you will get rejected and you will fail and it's just a part of life. You're not gonna be everybody's cup of tea and you're not gonna like everybody and that's okay. You know, w with Jacob, we actually used to set this as a goal. Okay, your goal is to go out and get rejected this week. So he would come back and he would say, 
I got rejected. I would say, you did it. You, you accomplished your goal. And so we kind of made fun of it. And, and, you know, it was heartbreaking for him. But he started to learn how to cope with it. And one day he came in and I said, how did you do with your goal? And he says, you know what? I didn't get rejected this week. So, you know, just you can handle that. It's okay. And then be courageous. So you're going to feel anxious, but you're going to be courageous. So you never know what you're going to get by taking a risk, by taking a risk to talk to somebody, by going and talking to a professor. All right, so really quick, some secrets of success. There's a great TED Talk. I have a whole list of references for you. Um, one of those talks is by Richard St. John, and he interviewed for seven years 500 people, successful people that attend the TED conference, OK? And what he found, he found eight secrets of success. So I definitely recommend the TED Talk. And I'm going to mention a couple of them right now. He said, push yourself. He said, push yourself through your shyness and push yourself through self-doubt. And then he also said, persist. Persist through failure and persist through crap. Criticism, rejection, assholes, and pressure. All right? <laughs> um, there's a new definition of confidence I want you to think about. Courage is not the absence of fear but rather the judgment that something else is more important than fear. So what I tell my students is being socially confident doesn't mean you're getting rid of your anxiety. It's that when you feel anxious and you do it anyway. All right, so um, what I want you to do um, when you get home tonight is I want you to look at the rest of your worksheet and it's gonna ask you to set some concrete goals for yourself. So it's gonna ask you, what are some things that you learned today that you're gonna take home with you? So try to do this tonight while it's still fresh in your head. And then write down some specific and concrete goals. You'll be much more likely to follow your goals if they are specific and concrete. So I wanna talk a bit about um, counseling and psychological services where I work. All services are free to, to registered UCSD students. We have individual one-on-one -on -one counseling that we can help students build their social confidence or see for any problem in life that you might be experiencing. We also offer couples counseling, family counseling, and we have a lot of groups, a lot of really great groups that we offer. One of those is my Building Social Confidence group. Uh, counseling and Psychological Services, we've got a website. That's how you can sign up for a lot of the groups, or you can call us. Um, and um, I also want to plug the Wellness Peer Education Program, because I run that program. So if you're interested in going out and doing workshops like this, check out our Facebook like page. If you like it, you're automatically entered for a chance to win a $25 Triton gift card. So I want to make that little plug. Um, I, you also have a list of references that I'm giving you. And I want to end on a story. So when my grandmother was on her deathbed, when she was dying, my mom was at her side. And um, my grandmother said to her, you know, it all seems like a dream. It all seems like a dream. And it made me think of that old song, you know, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 because life is but a dream. And I thought about how that applies to this and about how when I was younger, the, the risks that I didn't take because I was too nervous and I let that get in my way. I let my negative thinking or my fear get in my way. And I thought, wow, you know, one day I'm going to look back and this is all going to seem like a dream. And so what can you be doing right now to have some of that courage to face some of those fears and get out there and make your dreams come true. So that's what I want to encourage you all to get out there and make a change, uh, something different that you're going to work on your thoughts or your behaviors as you're, as you're moving forward to reach your social goals. Thank you very much for um, your attention and your participation today. Thank you.